Hello, everyone. This is Al-Fadi, and I'd like to welcome you back to another exciting episode of this series, Bible Prophecy in the Middle East. Last time we talked about the prophecies found in Daniel 2. Today we're going to talk about the battle of Gog and Magog, and I'm sure a lot of you are going to be even more excited to hear this. With us here in the studio, of course, as always, is our dear brother Joel Richardson, who is uh, the go-to when it comes to uh, interpreting these passages, simply because I like the fact that he will entertain uh, you know, let's call him traditional uh, way of looking at passages, but also he will bring in sometimes things that might be a little bit in tension with some of these interpretations as well. So, as always, welcome back, brother. It's good to be here. So, what are we to learn today about uh, this battle? Sure. So, Ezekiel 38 and 39, the battle of Gog and Magog. And let me just say this before we jump in. There is also a reference to Gog and Magog in Revelation 20 which is actually something that happens at the end of the millennium. What is described in Ezekiel 38, 39 is actually different than what's described in Revelation. Ezekiel describes something before the return of Jesus. Revelation uses the same language, but it's speaking of a final battle that happens at the very end of the millennium. And there's a handful of differences between the two passages, which makes us makes it very clear that these are two different things. I always like to qualify that because people, that always seems to be a big question that people ask when I lay out what I'm about to lay out. Mm -hmm. So first of all, let me just say that Ezekiel 38, 39, the Battle of Gog Magog, this is one of the towering Old Testament prophecies about the last days. You can't discuss the last days without touching on this one. Now, the popular interpretation throughout much of the Western world for the past 150 years or so, 130 years, has been that it is describing a prophecy, a bad guy from the Middle East, a coalition of nations from the Middle East that invades Israel and is destroyed. It's a different invader other than the Antichrist. It's sort of a preliminary battle. It's, an, uh, it's a different end time bad guy. What I would argue is that Gog is simply another name for the Antichrist. Okay, That was the interpretation of all of the early Christians. When you look at all of the earliest Jewish and Christian uh, commentators on this passage, they were going, Ezekiel's just talking about the same thing that all of the other prophets are talking about. There is a reason that in modern times we view it as something different. And the reason is, and this is interesting, is because the names and the peoples that are described here are clearly, primarily, Middle Eastern and North African nations. Now, because there is this Roman-centric, this Eurocentric perspective that's so popular among popular prophecy teachers today, they go, well, wait a minute, we think the Antichrist is going to be the Pope or Nikolai Carpathia from Romania, that's in the Left Behind series, or some other, you know, Macron or someone from Europe. They go, we know dogmatically the Antichrist comes from Europe. Therefore, since Ezekiel clearly describes a Middle Eastern invasion, it must be a different battle. It must be a different bad guy. It must be something different. And that's a huge assumption. It shows where a faulty assumption imposed upon other passages, classic eisegesis, causes us to misinterpret very important texts. When you look at Ezekiel 38 and 39, it's clear that as a direct result of God judging and destroying these armies, all of the nations will come to know Yahweh. Israel will come to know Yahweh. God will pour out his spirit on Israel. And God himself will actually be present in Israel, on the ground. These are all things that can only be explained at the end of the final seven years when Jesus returns. Okay? Right. Again, Ezekiel is just describing the same thing that all of the other prophets. This is an anti-Christic prophecy. So the question now is, what nations... What peoples does Ezekiel highlight? And how do we rightly interpret the names that he specifies? And that's really what I want to talk about today. Wonderful. So uh, where do you want to go? Okay. So let's just begin. I'm going to read um, Ezekiel 38, verses 8 through 9. And this is where he lists the names. So the Lord says through Ezekiel, in the latter years, he's actually speaking to Gog. It's very interesting, is that the Lord through Ezekiel is speaking to the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. He says, in the latter years, you will come into the land 
that has been. Now, notice this. It's really fascinating. He describes the current day state of Israel. You'll come into the land that has been restored from the sword, whose inhabitants have been gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. But its people were brought out of the nations, and they are now living securely, all of them. You will go up. You will come like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your troops, and many peoples with you. It's important to specify that Ezekiel lists many of the nations, but then he, he also says, and many, many others with you. So what he's about to list is not comprehensive, mm -hmm. but he does list some of the key. So who are these? Okay, yeah. so we've got Magog. Mm -hmm. And Magog, it says Gog is from Magog, and he is the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. Um, he will have Persia, Cush, Put, Gomer, and Tagorma. Now these are all names that now, other than Persia, most of us have no idea. These come from the Table of Nations in Genesis 10. Mm -hmm. Okay, They're very ancient biblical names. But we have to focus on how did Ezekiel understand these nations. Exactly. Yeah. And so here's, here's the important point, because again, in popular prophecy books, almost everyone will say, again, these American prophecy teachers will say this is a Russian-led Middle Eastern, North African coalition of nations, but it's led by Russia. They always put the emphasis as the leader is from Russia. And they get to this conclusion, this is interesting, by they, they take an approach to interpreting these names through what I call, for lack of a better term, the historical wild goose chase method. So they'll say, for example, Magog. They'll say, what does Magog mean? How do we interpret? How do we understand what Magog means? Well, they'll say, well, notice that in the first century, 500 years after Ezekiel, they'll say Josephus says that Magog became the Scythians, which he does. And they'll say the Scythians, they migrated out of Asia Minor, out of Turkey. They came into Bulgaria, Romania, Moldova, Ukraine. They came around the Black Sea, and they eventually spread out up into Russia. They intermixed. You know, so you're tracing the, the bloodline, the intermarriages, the migration patterns of these peoples. You go through all the history books. You try to figure it out. Who did Magog become? And they say they eventually became the Russians. So when they say Magog, they go, that means Russia. Mm -hmm. That's the historical wild goose chase method. I would argue that a much more responsible method is the historical grammatical method, which is simply to say this. How did Ezekiel understand these names? Where did they live in his day? How did Ezekiel's immediate audience understand these names? And that's important, by the way, because, I mean, as a prophet, he probably didn't even know when the fulfillment of this might take place. Exactly. You know, oftentimes prophets will just look at the top of the mountain. They do not know what happens in between in sure. the valleys. And, and in his mind, he could have been expecting it to happen immediately. Sure, right? sure. So it doesn't make sense for him to talk about things. I mean, the Lord speaking through him doesn't make sense for the people to hear names and they feel like, oh, it's not in my day. I mean, I don't even know who these people are. You know, sometimes right. God wants you to get excited about what you're hearing. Yeah, and yeah. so, you know, I, another way to say this is he uses the geographic correlation method. Mm -hmm. So in his day, Magog was Turkey. Quite simply, in his day, Magog was Turkey. So he used the name for the region of Turkey in his day. And all we have to do is know where were these peoples in Ezekiel's day, how did Ezekiel understand these names, and where, what regions was he pointing to. And so here's what's interesting is I've done very careful analysis of different prophecy books. And what a lot of guys do is it's almost like a card trick. It's almost like a magic trick. It's almost like sleight of hand, because in order to create the maps that they want to, they switch methods from name to name. Mm -hmm. So with Magog, they want to prove it's Russia. They'll use the wild goose chase, historical migration method. But with some of the other names, they'll use the grammatical historical. They'll use the geographic correlation method. Well, first of all, you have to be clear in terms of which method you're using, and you have to be consistent with all the names. Right. So if you want to say, well, Magog means Russia, you have to also use that same method, let's just say with Gomer. The, Gom the Gomerites became the Gemari, which became the Sumerians, which became the Celts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you'll see all these books, the coming Russian invasion of Israel. You'll never see a book that's the coming Irish invasion of Israel, right? Mm -hmm. But if they're to be consistent, you would have to do that. Um, but you don't see that because that's not politically popular 
in the United States. So this is where, unfortunately, political bias has influenced wrongly the interpretation of biblical prophecy. So uh, what I've done here just to help viewers understand is I've thrown up a few maps. These are maps of popular prophecy teachers. And some of them are a little bit grainy, but notice in this first map, you've got Rosh. Rosh is highlighted, that's Russia. Mm -hmm. The emphasis is on Russia and all of the Turkic, uh, former Soviet Russian nations of Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, et cetera, et cetera. But you also do have Iran and Turkey and Libya, North Africa and Sudan. Um, here's another map, again, notice they're coming down from Russia. He includes Germany, this particular teacher includes Germany. Um, which is funny, actually. This is, again, just a, kind of a humorous American prophecy teacher. He looks at the word Gomer, which in the Semitic root is three letters. It's G-M-R. And he goes, well, that's pretty close to Germany, <laughs> which technically would be G-R-M. Um, the problem is, of course, Germans refer to their land as Deutschland. So, you know, it's kind of this funny... Um, etymological argument that doesn't even really work. It's close. Well, Gomer sounds like Germany, like that's really bad hermeneutics, but you actually see this logic sometimes in books. Here's another map. Uh, again, this big emphasis up on Russia. They're coming down from the region of uh, the Caucasus and Chechnya and Russia and so forth. And one final map, again, the emphasis is on Russia, Magog is up there in Russia. Now notice how they're all a little bit different. If you really compare the maps, they're slightly different, mm -hmm. but there's always a big emphasis on Russia. Right. Now what I've done is contrasted a series of simple Bible atlases. Now Bible atlases are put together by various evangelical scholars, usually a team of interdisciplinary you know, academics. They don't have any prophetic bone to pick. They're not trying to prove some prophecy. Here's the new Moody Atlas of the Bible. Notice they have Magog, Meshach, Gomer, Tubal, Tagorma, all in... Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. Modern-day Turkey. Anatolia, Asia Minor, Turkey. Here's the Zondervan Atlas of the Bible. Magog, Gomer, Tagorma, Meshach, Tubal, Turkey. The Holman Bible Atlas, same thing, all in Turkey. And notice how they're all, again, slightly different in terms of if it's East or West Asia Minor. There's some variants, but for the most part... They're very clear that in Ezekiel's day, these names mm -hmm. referred to, here's the IVP Atlas of Bible History. They're referring to Asia Minor. And these are very reputable academic, uh, basically, entities. Yeah. And notice the dramatic difference between the simple, again, evangelical Bible atlases and the popular prophecy books. Mm -hmm. I would argue that the atlases have it correct. So what I've done here is I've made a map to understand what is Ezekiel talking about? Where does the Antichrist come from? And essentially, understanding the Israel centricity of the story, I just put a compass on the map. Essentially, Ezekiel is highlighting the leader of this coalition from the north, a significant emphasis on the region of Turkey, with Persia to the east, with Sudan to the south, with Libya to the west, and as we already said, many nations, many other nations will be included. Um, but this is just sort of, he's framing out this coming gathering of the surrounding nations against Israel. And once again, even as we saw with Daniel 2, um, the emphasis is on Turkey. And, and that's important. And again, it's not an indictment of all Turks by any means. It's not an indictment of all Turkey. But the prophets say that it's from this region. It's from this region that this last day's dictator would emerge and he would exert his control over the region and lead an invasion against God's people, against Israel. And so it's amazing to see the degree to which this is beginning to come into focus in our day. So to wrap up this uh, episode, what do you, do you expect our viewers to come out of this the way we laid it out for them? Well, for all intents and purposes, the the world events, ground reality, is presently confirming what Ezekiel said 2,500 years ago. You know, what these ancient biblical prophets declared is coming into focus in our day. Now, we don't know the exact timing. We don't know how long it takes. We're watching things like the Turkish, um, they're zeroing in on the year 2023, which is the 100-year anniversary mm -hmm. of the abolishment of the Ottoman Empire, the abolishment of the Ottoman Caliphate, the Caliph, and this type of thing. And 
and uh, the AKP party, Erdogan, President Erdogan, is using rhetoric of essentially reestablishing the Ottoman Empire and all of this kind of stuff. And I've been saying this for well over a decade. You know, the liberal secular media was making fun of me. Oh, he's an alarmist. He's crazy. But we're seeing now this is well acknowledged, this established, this NATO uh, nation is becoming the new Iran. And so, as I said, it's confirming biblical prophecy. And the scriptures say, when we see these things, lift up your head because your redemption is drawing close. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, brother. Uh, and uh, before we wrap it up, uh, what should we expect next? So in the next uh, episode, we're going to jump into Daniel chapter 11 and this prophecy concerning the kings of the north and the south. And we'll see how, once again, whether it's Daniel 11, whether it's Daniel 2, whether it's Ezekiel, they all are essentially telling the same story from different angles, emphasizing different facets, but they're reiterating the same story over and over and over again. Amen. Exciting. Thank you so much. And hopefully everyone is enjoying this. Until we meet again next time, have a blessed day. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. We can't make these quality videos without the help of partners like you. So please consider becoming a Patreon supporter today at patreon.com forward slash Sierra International. I want to make sure you always get notified when we release a new video. So please click the bell to be notified. And of course, make sure to subscribe to this channel. If this video was helpful to you, please click the thumbs up. Thank you.